In this video, I'm going to show you the top six DIY woodworking hand tools and how to use them. Welcome back to David's DIY Reviews. On this channel, we do a lot of DIY woodworking how-tos, woodworking builds, tool reviews, tool tutorials. Today, we're going to be looking at my personal top six kind of DIY woodworking hand tools. We're going to be looking at the hand saw, coping saw, hand drill, tape measure, combination square, and a claw hammer. In my opinion, that's the top six you want to start out with, and I'm going to show you the best way to use them. The first step to making your cut will be setting up the saw and guiding the blade to start your cut. You can either guide it with the knuckle of your thumb like this, or sometimes I like to use the edge of my fingernail just like this. Next, you want to remember to cut just on the waist side of your line on the material that you're cutting. The next thing to remember is to allow for the kerf of the saw. That is the groove in the wood that you're cutting that will be created by the actual width of the blade of the saw. The first tip I have for you guys is to point your index finger along the length of the saw. This will help you guide your saw and turn it if needed when making your cut. So before you start your cut, you want to start your kerf. And to do that, you pull back on the saw. As you're cutting, you want to try to move the saw in an oscillating motion like this. That will help keep the saw from binding up as you make your cut. As you're cutting, try to use the full length of the blade. Let the saw do the work. And remember, the saw only cuts on the forward stroke. So you only really want to apply pressure when cutting a forward motion. When you reach the end of your cut and are near the point where your off cut piece is going to come off, you want to shallow out the angle of your blade. This is also helpful if you're cutting wood that is wet. And remember, at the end of your cut, you want to support the waist portion of your wood to keep the wood from cracking and chipping as it comes off. My first bonus tip for you guys that you may not know about is that the angle that is cut on the handle of a saw can actually be used for layout just like a combination square. The way that works is you just take your saw, place it against your wood like this so that the handle is perpendicular with the edge of your material and that will make the blade straight across your wood. You take your pen or pencil, make your line. Just the same as if you want to do a 45 degree angle, you take the saw, put it against your wood like this, take your pen or pencil, and make your line. The next tip I have for you guys is if you're cutting a piece of material and it's binding against the saw blade, because maybe there's a lot of tension in the piece of wood you're cutting, you can actually put a screw or a piece of metal, like a nail, into the kerf that will hold the wood and the cut apart and keep it from binding. Another tip I have for you guys, if you're having trouble cutting straight along the line you've made, you can clamp a piece of material against the line that you're cutting to run the blade of the saw against, and that will really help you make a nice straight cut. <laughs> The first and most common use for a combination square is marking or checking 90 degrees. That's really useful and probably the one that people do most. Another good use for the 90 degree function is you can mark around square stock perfectly so your lines match up when you go to cut it. Another really good use for the 90 degree function is checking saw blades to make sure they're perpendicular on like table saws or skill saws. You can also use it to make sure that the fence on a jointer is square, or even the miter fence, the miter push fence on a table saw is square. The second most common and obvious part of a combination square is the 45 degree angle. And a really good use for that is obviously just drawing lines at 45 degrees across your material. Another good one is to remove the body, and you do that by unscrewing the screw underneath the rule part of the combination square, remove it, then you can use just the body and you can use that to set saw blades to 45 degrees, like on a table saw or a miter saw. 
or even like a skill saw because sometimes they can get out of whack. It's a really good tool for that. The third use for combination square that a lot of people don't really think to do but is one that I really like is that you can actually use it as a depth gauge. You can set it to get your depth and then you can use it to do things like transfer a mortise to a tenant for cutting or you can use it you know to set the depth of bits on a router you know even uh, table saw blades things like that using it as a depth gauge is really useful another really good use for just the rule part of a combination square is using it to check flatness of material there, or even you know you could use it to check the sole of a plane and the reason that they're better than a lot of other things to use for that is because the rule on a combination square is going to be milled really really flat they're thicker and stiffer so it's really going to show you if something's flat a lot better than just using a tape measure or a regular ruler another really great common use for a combination square common use combination square i've said that a million times already sorry but is to use it to draw parallel lines down your material just like this another really great use for setup and layout when doing projects is you can use it kind of set up like this to set different parts in place when you're doing setup on your projects. Also a lot of newer combination squares have levels in them which is really good for leveling things. Another good use is just to remove the ruler because once again the ruler portion of a combination square is really strong, really solid, really precise. It's going to be always better than a tape measure, a lot better than you know a cheaper ruler or anything else like that. I know I stopped counting but we're on number nine and the ninth probably most useful use for a combination square it's just the same words over and over use combination combination square I know it's crazy but anyway the ninth best use for a combination square is probably using it as a depth gauge to set saw blades router bits uh, setting joiners up so that the deck is the perfect height above the blade um, you know depth depth setting like that is really really useful and the tenth really, really useful tip for combination squares is it's something that I actually don't have, but you can get protractor bits and you can get center finding bits for them. And if you do a lot of work with round products, round wood, round plastic, whatever it is you're doing, those adapters, they're going to be really good for setting up your projects for cutting, marking, so on and so forth. Um, if, if you do that kind of work, picking a couple of those up, they're really going to help you. Another little hidden feature that most good combination squares have too is they actually have a built-in scribe in the bottom. And that's going to be really useful on the job site or around the house when you don't have a pen or pencil. The first and maybe one of the most important things about using a coping saw is to have the blade tight. You pretty much want to tighten the handle as tight as you can get it. That's going to help when you're turning and making fine curved cuts. So when starting with a coping saw, you want to either have your thumb on top of the blade like this or sometimes your finger like this to get the blade started. So just like with any saw, you want to pull the saw back away from the direction the teeth are cut to start your cut. This is going to make it much easier to get the cut started. The next probably most important thing to know about a coping saw is to only make turns in your cut while the saw is moving. You can only really turn when you're moving the saw because otherwise the blade will bend and probably break. Another way to make turns in your wood if the turn is very sharp is you can just rotate the saw like this while you're sawing and that will make it pretty easy to do. One thing nice about the coping saws is that the blade is removable. What that means is that you can actually take the blade out and put it in either direction depending on your preference of whether you like to cut on the back stroke or whether you like to cut on the forward stroke. It's really up to you. Another good tip for you guys, if you're making a cut and while you're making the cut, the C of your saw is hitting either the wood or something else, you can actually rotate the blade within the saw to make it work better for you. Another great reason that coping saws have removable blades is so that you can cut out the inside of a piece of material. To do that, 
you simply drill a hole in your material, put the blade through the hole, reattach it, and then you can cut on the inside. Another thing that's really going to help is if you can hold the material you're cutting, that's going to keep the board a lot stiffer to put tension on it and help you make an easier cut. And also, as with most saws, the closer you can keep the cut you're making to your clamping device, the better it's going to be. It's going to keep the board more still and be easier to cut. And generally, coping saws are used for thinner pieces of wood. Really, only up to an inch is going to be suitable for a coping saw. My first bonus tip for you guys when using a coping saw, especially if it's a cheaper low-end coping saw, is that you can actually pull the C portion of the saw apart before you put the blade in it, and this will add some pre-tension and keep the blade a little bit tighter. My second tip for you guys also, if you're using a cheaper low-end coping saw, is that if you find that your handle is coming loose when you're using the saw, you can actually place a lock washer between the handle and the back part of the C, and when you clamp it down, it's going to keep the handle really tight. And like with any hand saw, let the saw do the work. More than ever with a coping saw, because the blades are so small and breakable, you really don't want to press hard on the saw, you want to let the saw work for you. The first thing to using a hammer is just having a good decent hammer around the house. I like to use a 16 ounce or in metric 450 gram hammer. That's a good medium range hammer, not too big, not too small, it's not going to be overkill, on smaller projects, it's still going to be big enough to drive heavier nails into harder wood. So that's my first suggestion, it's just getting a decent hammer, because old, worn out, too heavy, too light hammers, it's just going to be a nightmare. My first tip for you guys is going to be holding the hammer. You want to hold the hammer with your thumb pointing down the length of the hammer. That's going to help guide the hammer when you're nailing. Also, I know when you're just starting out, it's easy to want to choke up on the hammer and hold it closer to the head, but that's actually going to make it difficult for you, and that's a bad habit to get into. In the long run, you really want to hold the hammer at the end like this on the handle, and that's going to help use the weight of the hammer to drive the nails when you're nailing. The next thing is going to be holding the nail when you're nailing. You want to hold the nail close to the material that you're nailing, and you want to just tap the nail in to get it started. Just like this, just small taps to get it started. Also, if you're using softer wood, sometimes you can actually just press the nail into the wood with your finger and it will stand on its own. And then you can just hold it lightly and start your nailing. And remember, when you're starting your nail, let the weight of the hammer start to tap it in. Once you have the nail started, you wanna move your hand away from the nail and hold the material or put your hand out of danger's way to start nailing the nail. So you want to move your hand and then go ahead and start. And when you're nailing, you want to make sure you're striking the nail with the head of the hammer parallel to the nail itself so that it drives the nail straight down into the wood. And as you begin to actually finish nailing the nail in, you want to swing the hammer with your elbow. And as you're nailing, you always want to be focusing on the head of the nail. If when you're nailing, you bend the nail, if you haven't nailed it in too far, you're always best to remove the nail and start over because once the nail is bent, it's weakened and it's just never going to drive into your material very well. So you're always best to just remove it. If when you're nailing, the nail starts to lean and it hasn't gone in too far, what you can do is actually strike the hammer slightly across the head of the nail like this and when you're nailing that will actually straighten the nail out and my second really good tip for you guys if you happen to be nailing through something that's fairly deep or one piece into another and you want to pull the nail and restart it for whatever reason it's if possible always best to restart in a new position because otherwise the nail is going to follow the old hole and if it bent the first time or was crooked the first time, it's going to follow that hole and do the exact same thing the second time. So just move the nail over and start over. That's going to help a lot. Another good tip for you guys on what not to do is you don't want to nail 
right near the end of a piece of wood, especially if it's hardwood, because it's going to crack the end of the wood. If you have to nail near the end or you're nailing in thinner wood that's going to crack easily, you can pre-drill and just slide the nail through the first piece of wood and then nail it into the second piece of wood and that's going to make it really good. That's going to help you with a lot of smaller kind of finicky projects with small wood, thin wood, hardwood. It's going to help you from cracking your project when nailing. Another tip to try not to crack the material when you're using hammer and nailing is if you can nail through the grain rather than across the grain, it's going to help whenever possible to keep the wood from cracking. And hey, if you're just getting into woodworking, getting into using tools and building projects on your own, but you're having a little difficulty, check out this playlist in the YouTube card above. I've got a lot of great content in there on using hand tools. It's going to be a lot of help for you guys. So the next biggest thing is using a hammer to remove nails. That's probably one of the most difficult things that I see people struggling with. And the first part of that is holding the hammer properly. You want to hold the hammer with a reverse grip like this so that you can leverage up on the nail. So how you want to go about removing a nail is you slide the hammer into the nail, pull the claw up just to under the head, brace the material with your other hand, and you want to start just with little bumps like this to kind of work the nail loose. And then you can really give it one good pull and it's going to pull the nail out. And whenever possible, once you've removed your nail, you don't want to reuse old nails that have been pulled because they'll be bent, the heads will be ruined, and they're just not going to nail back into your wood all that well. So whenever possible, throw that nail away, start with a new one. And a couple tips for protecting your material when you're removing nails. If you want to protect the material, you can lay a piece of wood on top, then slide your hammer on top and leverage on top of that, and then your hammerhead's not going to damage the wood. Also, if you have a really long nail that's really tall and you can't quite get the leverage with the hammer, you can slip in a thicker piece of wood that's going to bring the hammer head closer to the head of the nail and it's going to allow you to pull that nail much easier. And if you're starting a project and you're kind of afraid that you're going to damage the wood or bend the nails or struggle with using a hammer, don't be afraid to just grab a scrap piece of wood and some nails and practice driving them in. You really want to Focus on looking at the head of the nail when you hammer, and that's really going to help. Just give it a few tries, practice, and then get into your project, and you won't be so apt to damage it. And when you're nailing and you almost have the nail all the way in, slow down at the end, and that's going to keep you from damaging the wood as you're getting the nail flush with the surface. There are two main types of hand drills. The first and most common is going to be an egg beater style drill like this, and the second uh, a little less common, but you do see them, is more of a pistol style hand drill like this one here. The first thing to know about these manual hand drills is putting the drill bit in. Most of them are going to have this style chuck that doesn't have a chuck key where you just turn the chuck and it tightens on the drill bit. There are also some though a little better quality like this that uh, have more of a traditional style chuck with an actual chuck key. And those are, you know, in the end going to work better for you. The drill bit is going to stay tighter. So when you're using a hand drill, you always want to be kind of face down over the drill. That way you can look straight down the shaft of the drill and keep it perpendicular, you know, straight up 90 degrees from the work that you're drilling into. And that's going to ensure a nice straight hole. And always good to remember clockwise is going to drill into your material. Counterclockwise is going to bring the drill back out. And always with drilling, you want to let the drill bit do the work. Let the weight of the drill do the work. You don't want to be applying too much pressure. If your drill bits are sharp, you really hardly have to push at all. Just let the drill do the work and you'll find you have a nice smooth hole. And as you get through the material like this, continue drilling. And then don't just pull the drill straight back out. Continue turning the drill and pull the drill out of the material. That's going to give you a nice smooth straight hole. And a, a good tip if you're struggling to start your drill off straight, if you have another piece of material you can kind of set it beside where you're about to drill and that allows you to line your drill straight up and down. Actually if you, if you took your piece of material and cut like a 90 degree into it you'd have 90 degrees up and down on two sides of the drill and that would allow you to 
start your drill off and continue drilling pretty straight until you get it going and it will hold itself straight. Now I've got one of these uh, Fisker kind of pistol style drills. Actually all three of these drills are Fiskers and like I said link in the description below if you're in the market for a hand drill. And these are they're nice but just like a cordless drill or a quarter drill when you're applying pressure it's going to want to lean the drill. That's where the the egg beater style drills are nice because you're you're applying pressure straight down on the top of the drill, but it's going to be the same process. You're going to start your drill bit and just start turning and just let the drill do the work. Um, you know, these are, these are a nice little drill for around the house for quick drilling. You know, you got to drill something into drywall so you can reach a stud or you want to pre-drill something to nail. This is a, a, good, a good solution because, I mean, you can pick one of these up for like 30 bucks. If you drill something once a month, once a year, it, it beats saving like a DeWalt cordless for, you know, two, three hundred dollars. And as for maintenance on these hand drills, all you want to do is make sure you've got a light kind of film of oil on the gear, uh, the main gear and the drive gear, and that's going to allow this to turn really freely. Sometimes you can drop a bit of oil down in the shaft as well, but if you're using these, uh, you know, a small amount of time, they're going to stay lubed up nicely. You'll also notice some hand drills, the top of the handle turns. That's a nice feature to have when you're looking for one because you can hold your palm on there and actually turn the drill as you need it to apply pressure and keep it straight and you don't have to turn your whole body. And as promised guys, if you don't have uh, brad drill bits, which are wood drill bits, and you're using a regular metal drill bit, there is a trick to starting them. You can either, you know, center punch your material, which isn't a bad idea anyway, so if you center punched or not, the trick is to turn the drill in reverse about one or two turns and that's going to give you a nice little point to start on and then you can begin to drill straight and you're going to make sure that you drill on point every time. The first thing to know about the tape is actually reading the tape measure itself, probably the most difficult part for most people. This tape in particular reads in inches and centimeters. For the first six inches, this tape reads in 30 seconds of an inch, and after six inches, it reads in sixteenths of an inch. So what that means, between each inch up to six inches, there are 32 increments between each inch. And after six inches, inches are divided into sixteenths. If you're not sure the fractions of an inch that your tape reads between inches, it's really simple. You just count the lines between the inch, and that's what it is. The easiest way to figure out the fractional measurement on a tape measure is to look at the last even inch number, then count the lines afterwards, and it'll be that number divided by the total number of lines between that inch. So for instance on this tape, if I have a measurement that's 7, and then a little bit more, and I happen to count those lines out to what the measurement is, and there happens to be 3 out of 16, then the measurement is 7 and 3 16. This tape also measures in centimeters, which is really handy if you're converting from inches to centimeters. My first tip for you guys is to know that there are 25.4 millimeters in an inch. So if you happen to be converting from plans that are in inches and using centimeters afterwards, it really helps. The next thing about a tape to know is the tab, the tab on the end. Often people will say to you, why does the tab on the end move? My tape's broken, the tab's already loose. That's actually not true. The tab moves for a reason. The tab on a tape moves in and out according to the thickness of the tab itself. If you're measuring up against something like this, the tab will push in. Same as if you're pulling off the end of an object like this, the tab will pull out to make up for the thickness of that line itself. Sometimes tabs on end of tapes can become bent or worn out, which actually brings me to my next tip. It's easy to start your measurement from one or two inches in if your tab is worn out or the end of your tape is worn so that you can't see the measurements and you just start your measurement from a couple inches in and it'll always be precise. Another trick is to actually know the length of your tape itself. This is useful when measuring inside to inside. This tape in particular is two and three quarter inches wide. So if you're measuring inside to inside of something and you can't quite get your tape to where you can read the measurement, all you do is butt the tape up against the end and add that width of the tape measure, which is two and three quarter inches for this particular tape, to the measurement where it meets the tape. And that'll be your measurement. 
Another good way to measure inside to inside is to take your tape like this, put it down, pull it out, and actually bend the tape down like this, and then look to see where the tape meets the object. Very handy for a lot of construction work. Another thing I'd like to mention is a good way not to break your tape measure. If you happen to be measuring something that's very close to the overall length of your tape, it's really good to slow down near the end. For instance, this is a 12 foot tape, so if I was measuring something 12 feet long, I would slow down near the end because oftentimes your tape will overextend, won't recoil, and your tape is broken. Can't say I've ever done that before. Well, yeah, I have. Oh well. Another good tip for using a tape measure more like a ruler is just to pull the tape out, lock it in place. That way you can move the tape on and off your materials using whatever measurements you want to use more quickly than moving the tape in and out every time. And don't worry guys, if you're having trouble using a tape sometimes or reading the tape measure, it's one of those tools where you just keep using it more and more and it'll get easier and easier for you. Another good thing to know about older worn out tapes or even any tape in general is to be careful when you're recoiling the tape that it doesn't slide along your fingers because sometimes older tapes can become chipped or worn to the point where the edges are sharp and they can actually cut your fingers. I've actually seen this happen and it's not that good. So there we go guys, that's the top six. That's all the best tips and tricks on how to use them. In this description below is gonna be links to all these tools I looked at today where you could buy them if you're looking into getting tools. If not guys, see you in the next one. Thank you.